Hello and welcome back. Uh, so here's a, an exercise now. We're going to do another two-tailed test. Uh, we've actually already done this problem already. Uh, there's really two samples in this exercise. Uh, so I've already produced one video uh, dealing with uh, part of the data in this in this um, problem. Uh, and now we'll do the second half. So, so here again, just to quickly go through it, we're looking at a lumber yard that produces a batch of two by fours uh, in eight foot and 12 foot length. So I've, the video that I've already produced covers the information for the eight foot lengths of wood of lumber and so in this one we'll do the 12 foot and we're actually going to work in inches so this will be 144 inches so each batch contains 50 2 by 4s and we want it to be cut very accurately we don't want the 2 by 4 to be too short or too long it causes problems in constructions the lumber yard knows the standard deviation for the 12 foot lengths is 1.05 inches on the first day of the month, we take a batch uh, of the lumber to measure it to test for the accuracy. Uh, so the average length for the, let's skip that, for the 12 foot length we found was 144.3 inches. Using a level of significance 0.05, test to determine whether or not these two, uh, uh, the lumber is being cut accurately. So uh, again, first thing we need to do is develop our null and alternative hypotheses. H O and H J. We're testing a single population mean, and this is a two-tailed test, so it's equal or not equal. How do we know it's a two-tailed test other than the fact that it tells us right there? Well, it says right here what we're testing. Test to determine whether or not the lumber is being cut accurately. It doesn't say if it's being cut too long or too short uh, accurately. So is it uh, on spec, which here is 144 inches, uh, or not? So the null hypothesis, which always holds the equality, is that it is equal to 144, or it is not equal to 144. So let's uh, go through the rest of the test here. Our alpha is 0.05. Uh, calculate the test statistic. Oh, I didn't justify my resp my hypotheses. I always give my students trouble if they don't justify it. So the way I've formulated it in this case uh, is uh, in such a way that if the evidence supports the null hypotheses, uh, then I have reason to believe that we're cutting the lumber sufficiently accurately. If the evidence from the test supports the alternative hypotheses, then it means that I've got uh, reason to believe that there's a problem and uh, we should probably take some corrective measures uh, to improve the accuracy of our cutting machines. Okay, now we can get into calculating the test statistics. <coughs> Forget this, both tests, we've already done one. So our test statistic, this is a Z test, X bar minus our hypothesized value over the standard error. So our sample mean was here, 144.3 uh, minus our hypothesized value. Our standard error now is, where are we? Right up here, there's the standard error for the 12 foot length. So that's 1.05 inches divided by the square root of the sample size. One batch contains 50 pieces. And so now we can find our calculator here. <coughs> 144.3 minus 144 divided by, open that bracket, 1.05 over root 50 equals 2.02. 2.02. Okay, so there's our test statistic. Now, uh, let's scribble that in here. <coughs> Use the p-value approach to draw your conclusion. Okay, so we go to our z-tables and we wanna find our test statistic on the z-table. Now, this, was, this one can be a little bit tricky because again, of how the table is designed. So my test statistic was 2.02. .02. So where those two numbers come together, here I have that value of 0.9783. Now again, this is giving us this area to the left. When we're doing a two-tailed test, what we want is the probability in one of the extreme ends. So if I have a, a positive test statistic, which in this case I do, the probability that I want is, let me change the color of my ink here to make it more clear. The probability that I would want for this test statistic would be that upper tail. 
And then, just as we did in the first video, because this is a two-tailed test, we would multiply that probability by two in order to obtain our p-value. So, there's two ways that we can go about doing this. One is to use our positive test statistic, but then in order to find that probability in the upper tail, I need to take one minus that, and then to find the p-value, we need to multiply that by two. So if I find my calculator here, this is going to be one minus 0.9783, and then we times this by two, and I have 0 0.0434. So that would be my p-value for this test. Now, a shortcut, if you're comfortable using these tables, the shortcut could be to look up the negative value of your test statistic. So negative 2.02, and there I have 0 0.0217 and then multiply that by 2 times 2 and we get exactly the same thing. Again, that's because this table, this distribution is perfectly symmetric. So if I looked up this negative 2.02, .02, this is a probability of 2.17, oh, I mean 0 0.0217, which would be exactly the same as the area on the upper tail corresponding to positive 2.02, okay? So, in either case, we have, uh, we have our p-value, 0 0.0434. Oops, wrong one, here we go. So our p-value, 0.0434. Now, what is our conclusion? Well, again, our exposure here to a type one error is sufficiently small relative to our tolerance towards a type one error. So our rejection rule here is that we reject if that p-value is less than or equal to alpha. In this case, 0 0.04 is less than 0 0.05, so we can comfortably reject. Meaning, I have evidence to show that we are not cutting the 12 foot lengths accurately. If this is what my evidence supports, and again, coming back to our justification, what does it mean if our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses? Well, it means that there's a problem that needs to be fixed, okay? So that's, that's it for our p-value approach. Now we'll verify this with the critical value approach. Critical value for alpha 0.05. We might have this one memorized by now. If we come to our table again, now what I want to find, I'll try to keep this symmetric with this, I want to find that critical value that corresponds not with alpha, but with alpha divided by two, because alpha defines the size of our rejection space, and we're going to reject if the test statistic appears to be too large or too small. So we want the total size of our rejection space to be equal to alpha, which means that I want half of alpha to be on each side of that distribution. So this is going to be a z that corresponds with alpha divided by two on both the upper and lower side of the distribution. So that's uh, 0 0.05 over two. So that's going to be z 0 0.025. And so finally, there's 0 0.025 that gives us a value of 1.96. And that's plus or minus, because I'm going to reject if it's greater than positive 1.96 or smaller than negative 1.96. And so if I come back here, redraw this distribution, here's 196 here, here's negative 196 here, our test statistic is 2.02, .02, so it's out here somewhere, and that is in that rejection space. So we find the same conclusion as we should expect. So everything's fine, we've got the right conclusion. I've already interpreted our conclusion. We have evidence to support uh, the alternative, so we have a problem that we ha should probably fix. Okay, part F. Verify your findings using the critical value approach. So again, 
only when we're doing a two-tailed test at a comparable level of significance uh, and confidence. So here's the corresponding confidence interval, one minus alpha, would be a 95% confidence interval and we're doing a two-tailed test. So in those two conditions, we can compare the results of uh, the confidence interval estimate with our hypothesis test. So you'll go to your formula sheet and you find this formula. And now this will allow us to find a lower limit and an upper limit between which we will be 95% confident that the true unknown population mean exists. Okay, If these confidence intervals are a little bit foggy, if you're not quite sure um, what's going on, I would encourage you to review uh, the videos in Module 8. We went through confidence intervals uh, a fair bit. So in here, we'll plug in our, for our, our value. So I have one, oh, not one point. I have 144.3 was that point estimate, plus or minus the critical value. And our standard error was 1.05 divided by the square root of 50. I'm just taking all the same information from up here. And finally, let's calculate that margin of error. 1.96. Times 1.05 divided by root 50 equals 0.291. So that's just this piece here. So now we'll calculate the limits. Uh, plus 144.3. So 144.59 is the upper limit. 144.59 and the lower limit, let's clear this, 144.3 minus 0 0.291, 144.009, whoa that's close, 144.0, I'll round it to 0 0.01. So this is a close one and the, what I mean by that is that this is consistent with uh, our tests. Our test supports the alternative hypotheses. Uh, our p-value was less than alpha and the reason why uh, that's consistent with this confidence interval is that our hypothesized value it lies just outside of that confidence interval. In this case it's very close uh, just as our p-value is quite close to alpha uh, but we can still draw the same conclusions here. Looking at this confidence interval, what I'm saying is I'm 95% confident that the true population mean is between 144.01 and 144.59. So what that means is, well, 144 is not in that interval. It might be close, but it's not in that interval. So at that level of confidence, I cannot say that it is 144. Okay, so that's a close one, but our results are all consistent and they always will be when you're comparing a confidence interval with a two-tailed test at a comparable level of significance uh, or confidence level. Okay, good. I hope that that was helpful. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, we'll uh, start making some more videos here. Okay, bye-bye.